We are starting next session. Uh, there will be two presentations, and uh, we start with the presentation by Stefano Landini, uh, who is uh, a school in School of Engineering, uh, uh, University of East Anglia. Thank you. Do you hear me? Yeah? Okay. Ready to go. So, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. I'm really humble to be being given the opportunity to talk to a uh, play for a mathematician as a humble engineering, so I hope not to be too boring, let's say, or too simple in a way. But we work to solve real life problems, so that's the nature of engineering. So let's see what I get from you. So the talk is about thermal management, mostly using solid liquid phase change. This is part of the research we have been looking at here at UEA Eng in collaboration with several institutions. I will give you some details with this all. So the agenda is, look at this. First of all, I always like to start talking, looking at stats, where we are, where we are supposed to go. This could be a little bit digression, but I always feel is the best way to start any talk. So we'll give you some uh, understanding of EV transport and how lithium-ion battery packs looks like. We'll look at challenges and then move on on solid liquid phase change materials, so PCM, how we use them for this specific application then what we've been looking at experimentally and numerically, and then some conclusion and future research we are interested in looking at in, uh, in the next couple of years. So first of all, I will start from this. It's really nice start from REN21. This is updated to 2024 report, so it's the brand new data. So if you see these plots, effectively we, what we are saying is that there's a growth of 16% in total final energy consumption. But the bad news is that the share of this covered by fossil fuel system is still plateauing since 20 years ago. So effectively 80% of our final energy consumption is still relying on fossil fuels. And Again, there was an increase of 58% compared to 10 years ago. So we are moving, but we are not moving fast enough to reach 2050 net targets. And we are all in this together, so we need to join our brains as engineer, mathematician, phys <coughs> physics, and manufacturing experts and try to tackle this. Some of the countries have different uh, final share of renewables, and that obviously reflect some historic approach that different countries have towards decarbonization of different sectors. So you will see in dark colors the country who have a higher share of renewables in final energy consumption. And not surprisingly, you see Scandinavia with that amazing hydro and in a way nuclear, even if it's not technically renewable, but it's definitely decarbonized. So we see that amazing share in Scandinavia. We saw a high share in Brazil and South America due to biofuels used for transportation. But then if we look at continental Europe, UK and USA, we are not doing great. We are still stopped around 10 to 15% of final energy consumption, mostly due to the fact that we are not moving enough quickly for heating and cooling and transport applications. So that's the goal. And just to be even more blunt, this is the global final energy consumption divided by use, and this is what we, we in Engineer UA, we always remind ourselves when we need to um, understand what is the sector where we should research on. We've been doing great for renewable electricity. That's not too bad, 28% is indeed renewable, but the point is that we forget the two big elephants in the room, mostly heating and cooling and transportation. As you can see from that stuff, we are not doing at all what we are supposed to be doing towards 2050 targets. If we look at the sector-wise distribution, and we focus on buildings, so there is a third on each sector, industry, buildings, and transportation. If we focus on buildings, that's even more astonishing because 77% of the final energy consumption is for thermal energy use, and these are some nice plots by the Eurostat in terms of the typical European household um, energy final use. And you see, of course, again, the space heating and the water heating covering more or less that 75% chunk. Okay? Now, when we look at transportation, which is another third of the chunk, that's even more striking. We see, first of all, that we still rely, regardless of how good our rails are or not across the globe, we still rely 
77% of road transportation. If we look at the share of renewables there, it's 4.6%, so barely nothing. And again, as I was saying before, this is due to mostly to biofuels in South America. And it's basically negligible in continental Europe, UK, or let's say the Western world. In terms of how this has been evolving in the past 10 years, you see again the same picture. So fossil fuel is steady at 96% of the final energy consumption for transportation as well. And renewable electricity, there's lots of big talks about electrification of transport. Again, 0.4% renewable, that's definitely not where we are supposed to look at. Now, this introduction is just to make the point that there are Let's say there are two main interests that we have here at UEA Engineering. One is speed up research in decarbonization of heating and cooling, again. And the second topic is move away, obviously, from fossil fuel power transportation. And if you look at any report, International Energy Agency, Renewable Energy 21, or even IRENA, all of them talk about the need to electrify both sectors. And this mostly means using heat pumps for heating and cooling application and using electric vehicles as an alternative to hydrogen-based transportation <coughs> for reaching the same goal. All of these are related to developing effective battery energy storage uh, systems. And for the sake of this talk, I will give you an example of how we have been researching on trying to enhance the performance of these battery energy systems in the framework of transportation. So the idea is we need to develop novel thermal management for enhancing performance of battery energy storage. To give you again the scale of this, this is what was happening in the past five years in terms of sale of electric vehicle depending on plug, hybrid, or battery, um, fully battery, basically system, the BEV. So you see a, an exponential trend in both registration and sales. And the prediction by International Energy Agency is that regardless of the scenarios, these are the typical scenarios we look at in terms of stated policy, announced pledges, and net zero uh, scenarios, so the most challenging one, you see again the growth in the next five, and in the next 10 years is either linear or again is keep staying uh, exponential. So that's the scale of the challenge of EV transportation and is related obviously to battery demand. You see on the left the gigawatt hour where, which we um, needed in the past um, five years again and then we saw the prediction of 25 and 2030 depending on the scenario and again you're looking at the same linear or exponential trend but this now, in terms of um, scale, is not anymore gigawatt hour per year. It becomes terawatt hour per year. This is a massive challenge of different aspects. Again, I will uh, focus on thermal. You might know the difference between hybrid, plug-in, and battery, but the most challenging uh, situation is, of course, the batteries, so the fully electrified vehicle, where effectively what we are looking at is the chassis of a car with a massive battery pack under your seat, and that's literally covered the entire chassis of the car. The key idea is that there are two different, that's actually make a massive difference in terms of thermal management approaches, so there are two different geometries there to look at. One is the pouch cell, so let's say prismatic sandwich cells that are uh, connected in terms of sub-modules in series and parallel, and then cylindrical battery pack as well, and you see a snapshot here of a typical Tesla um, Model S. With battery pack comes several challenges. This is the one that are not necessarily covered directly by thermal engineers, like us in our subgroup in the Thermal Fluids Lab. Driving range, weight, obviously the battery pack weights um, build up, let's say, the weight of the equivalent <coughs> engine from being a 10% of the car weight to be 55% of the weight of the car. So that's something that must be considered. Cost, of course, lithium batteries cost has been going down quite steeply, but they are still too expensive compared to the equivalent uh, internal combustion engine motor. 
the scarcity of battery raw materials and all the environmental impact uh, related to it, <coughs> charging infrastructures, that's one of the main topics and one of our colleagues, Salman Jalebi, is looking at as well. But most of these are related to the thermal issues. So what are the thermal issues of battery pack? So there are two main aspects, and these are data we've been collecting in the past years, including my own data from my PhD, who were just completed in, uh, formally in April 21, so quite fresh. And you will see a steep dependency of the performance of what we call the unaged condition of fresh battery you buy off the shell, you throw it in the car and you test it for the first time. You see a massive trend in terms of sensitivity to the average temperature, or I should say the average operating temperature of the battery pack. So as any electrochemical devices, the performance increase with temperature, more or less, and then they plateau at some point. The most important thing is that if you see the average power, there's not like a massive trend, a little bit increase from 0 to 50 degree, but the important thing is that the heat generation rate decreases a lot with the temperature. Okay? So you would say, well, I should move on the right as much as I can, but then something else triggers, which is the degradation. So lots of electrochemical degradation effects happen at both uh, low and high temperature, and this is just a snapshot of what we call the state of health, so the health of the battery pack compared to the fresh condition. So effectively how much percentage the battery lose in fresh capacity, the more we cycle it. And if you can see the plot in color, the more we go away from cold or hot condition, the operating life of the battery can double. And in this specific case, for this specific chemistry, we are seeing a massive increase in operating life going just five Kelvin across the 30 degrees Celsius optimum. Okay, that's how sensitive these devices are. And obviously if we look at the overall performance, so both the performance cycle by cycle and the performance in terms of degradation, we actually identify pretty clearly a nice sweet spot in terms of operating temperature. So what we are basically saying is that that pack should always, for the entire entirety of its life, operating between 25 and 30 degrees Celsius and with a preference I would point of course to the 30 degree with as much uniformity as possible. So that's the best operating condition of this pack. This brings me to solid liquid phase change. So there are two main um, thermal management approach that have been researched in the past I would claim probably 10 years, is solid liquid phase change, referred to usually as PCM or phase change materials, and liquid gas phase change, so mostly using dielectric, dielectric oils in both immersion or indirect cooling. In terms of solid liquid phase change, I mean, there was a talk about ice, I think, before lunch, so... Obviously, the idea is that there is that nice phase change in a specific temperature. And the idea is that if we can identify a specific phase change materials, regardless of the chemistry, for which that temperature glide between solidus and liquidus is around the optimal operating condition of the cell, what we are basically talking about is putting a thermal mass or a dampening factor there so that you try to stabilize the temperature around that optimum. And historically, we have been working with uh, organic PCM, so paraffin and esters, or inorganic salt hydrates. Obviously, for the battery, salt hydrates might be a little bit uh, challenging to be used for obvious electric circuit reasons. Paraffin and ester are not too bad, and there's lots of research what we have been doing as well in our research about using bio-based esters, so plant-based um, developed bioester as an environmentally friendly approach to thermal management of batteries compared to using petrol-based paraffins. Now, as a sample of what we've been doing in the past two years, this is an example of a project we did with, uh, in collaboration with Hochschule Luzern and University, um, Università Studi di Padova, so a university in, uh, in Italy. Croda, which is a company developing bio-based esters, and Ducosi, which is a company working in battery management systems based back in, uh, 
in Scotland, in Edinburgh. And what we were looking at is using 3D metal printing, so aluminum-based powder printed um, uh, blocks, effectively, with different geometry, different configuration, and embedding inside these, these phase change materials, and then testing them at different charge and discharge rates, so effectively different thermal loading, and see the effect on the temperature profile, and if we were capable to obviously isothermalize, as we say, the system. So this is a, a, an example of a single discharge where we look at single discharge of a battery pack and we see how the temperature profile looks like. And we obviously see a, a massive decrease compared to air, meaning air uh, force convection across the battery pack compared to using these um, phase change materials blocks. That's in a way is, any, is an easy task. The most difficult task is to look at um, consecutive or what we call the stress test cycles where we repeat the same cycles for several amounts of time. We really see how that PCM behavior um, go along the more we cycle the battery. And the interesting thing is that we work out that of course depending on the length of the testing and depending on the specific charge and discharge rate profile, we have different optimums and we work out with Pareto plots where we look at medium behavior, so the, the, um, the dark um, squared here, and the maximum, so the worst uh, condition in time across that uh, multi-cycle test. And we try to really identify the specific geometry that make us optimize two, di two different um, uh, optimization tasks. The first one is, of course, the thermal task, where we need to really try to achieve the minimization of the maximum temperature buildup and the temperature disuniformity. And the second task is, of course, to reduce the mass, so the additional mass of the thermal management system uh, into the car, because obviously that's what we call a dead weight on the car, and that's basically extra fuel we need to, well, fuel in terms of electricity, of course, that we need to boost into our engine to move the same um, paying load, as we say. Once we complete this experimental test, in this in case was a, a follow-up project in collaboration with Amman Arab uh, University. So we look at doing some CFD, some computational fluid dynamics, based on, obviously, uh, validation with our experimental data. So what we look at as a starting point is to validate the CFD based on our most simple block, so what we call the small simple blocks. And obviously we did all, all the standard task of computational fluid dynamics that must be done. So obviously we implement a specific uh, methods, in, in this case using ANSYS Fluent and a method based of enthalpy porosity with a specific MASHI coefficient, which you saw here. I'm not going to spend too much time on the, on the maps. We did all our nice mesh density uh, sensitivity and time stand sensitivity. I should, I, sh I should mention all these nice pictures are uh, merits of Jack Panther there in the first row. So <laughs> just to recognize the beauty of these pictures. And we also validate, of course, the model based on two different um, tests uh, at different charge and discharge rate speed. That's the 3C and 5C logos that you see uh, in this specific picture, and obviously we work at them more or less across all the tests. It was a really nice um, accuracy within the, sorry, an error, root mean square error within the actual accuracy of our experimental rig, so we were happy about that. And then we start looking at different geometry of the things and try to see which one would, again, reach that specific goal, so enhance the thermal performance, so minimize maximum temperature, minimize temperature disuniformity, and minimize the extra load, which in this case is the maximum amount of uh, metal we allow the system to be added to. There are different um, geometry we tested, obviously the standard no fins and then vertical fins, horizontal fins with different number of elements, A shape and B shape, just to see the effect of uh, buoyancy or equivalent length of the of the thermal fluids push. And just to show you some results, what we first look at is a small scale system. So effectively I'm talking about a pouch shell of um, 500 millimeter height and 300 millimeter width. And we look at the different effect of the fins, and this is just a snapshot of 
some of the tests we did. We've uh, effectively plot the maximum temperature, temperature of uniformity, and the liquid fraction of the PCM, so how much we're actually using that mass of uh, phase change materials. And the main outcome, not surprisingly one would claim, is that at, small, at this small scale, there was not a massive dependency on the geometry. There was a mild uh, increase or benefit in terms of decreasing the temperature, this uniformity, sorry, moving from vertical to horizontal geometries, but it was really depending on the specific time step it as the specific length of testing we were considering to evaluate the performance of the system itself. Then what we did, and this was a suggestion of actually Jack, he came in and said, what if we scale up the system to 10? What if we are proposing the same geometry, but for 10 times the scale, which typically in battery pack management means 10 times obviously the capacity in terms of kilowatt hour of the battery pack. So we did that, we reproposed the same numerics and I'm gonna show you the results for the same subset of geometry. And looking at the scale up system, of course, we are starting uh, appreciating the difference between geometry. So you see uh, an actual, depending on the different time scale you are looking at, either in between the uh, the discharge phase or even at the end of, of uh, the discharge itself, you see a, a differentiation of the temperature profile in terms of maximum point and also temperature division uniformity at the end of the discharge actually build up and you see that difference. The problem is that this is a single, a single test. This would repeat it, sorry, it would um, come back every single cycle and even a narrow temperature disuniformity of five to 10 Kelvin can actually half your battery pack operating life. So that's a serious temperature disuniformity buildup. This again is a, obviously counterplots of PCM temperature and liquid fraction. And the most um, astonishing things, but not necessarily astonishing, <laughs> is that there was not a massive difference between the performance of the A shape and the V shape. And there was effectively a good decrease of temperature disuniformity by using the horizontal shape things, just because effectively we were recreating pockets, small <laughs> micro channel style pockets of PCM to really try to stop necessarily the buoyancy effect and localize the latent heat exactly in each single section in terms of lengthwise of the, of the battery height, um, pouch cell height. We did again, again the same Pareto plots. I'm not gonna spend time on this, but effectively we tried to use the same approach to really kind of balance the effect of added mass and operating temperature um, or thermal performance of the system as well. And again, the main outcome was that indeed the horizontal was the geometry was actually giving some benefit in terms of reduce uh, extra mass of a thermal management system and good thermal performance as well. So the main conclusion is that, of course, battery pack, they need constant and uniform temperature uh, across the pack to reach high performance in terms of single, single charge or discharge events, but also along the operating life in terms of achieving the lowest degradation mechanism possible. PCM is part of the solution, can really make a contribution there, but is not per se the solution. Heat exchanger geometry substantially influenced the temperature profile when scaling up the system, where build up that equivalent length in the physics. Strong sensitivity in both system scale and time scale, so effectively the time scale again is an important factor when we are actually um, try to estimate the performance. It depends on which specific time scale we're looking at. Are we looking at a full discharge of the pack or we're looking at 50%, uh, 20% or 75% discharge of the pack itself. Future research we're looking at, um, more sophisticated optimization techniques, that's where obviously MAF or, or COMP people can definitely help us and contribute a lot. Uh, this is gonna be a follow-up of the UE Amman Harab. We are looking and getting funding to look at composite PCM, so this is not just about using Additives to the PCM is combining with metal foams or polymer foams coated with metal thin layers to get the same equivalent thermal conductivity effect but with lower mass 
uh, addition. Then we are looking at the competitor, which is single phase liquid or two phase, um, two phase liquid gas hybrid immersion coolings. And this is gonna be a co-project with uh, one of our partners in India, uh, Symbiosis SIT. And of course, in our lab, we have a couple of PhD projects looking specifically at this. One is loop heat pipes. So looking again at two-phase liquid gas uh, system to reach the same out, uh, output. And this is in collaboration again with the University of Padova. And the second one I'll start in this October is going to be working on composite PCM, but in this case for stationary thermal energy units for the heating and cooling sector, as was referring to before in collaboration with uh, Oxshule. Final things, uh, obviously we are, well, we are based here, so if you are interested in looking at the experimental facility of what we call the UA Thermal Fluids Lab, please do so. We are more than happy to show you around. We have rigs on thermal energy units um, storage characterization, again, as I said, battery testing facilities, a droplets and wettability test rig, which is now uh, on jack, but it was uh, started by Alex Ascunis, obviously, and, uh, and also some nice new SLA 3D printing with high definition, which we can develop prototype and look at the effect of micro scale surface characterization um, for enhancing evaporative cooling and even other, obviously, applications. That's all. Thank you all. Uh, I hope it was insightful and definitely completely different from any <laughs> presentation you had in this week. I'm pretty sure, but you know, I just wanted to entertain you, entertain you a little bit as well, instead of trying to be smart with math and possibly fail. <laughs> so, Thank yeah, you, happy to take a. Um, any questions? Any questions? Not many? Okay, then uh, let's uh, uh, thank Stefano once again, and we go to the second presentation.